Welcome to A1 TV, The Mark Show. Today's guest, another interesting chat, just to chat about everyday life and everyday people and uh, what they're doing in their life. Today's guest is a person I met a long time ago, actually, at a little radio station called SEN in Melbourne. Darren was uh, one of the on-air presenters and behind the scene presenters. Welcome, Dash, as they call you, G'day. and uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> G'day, Stoney. Yeah, the old Monday's expert, uh, 2009 or thereabouts. So yeah, it's been a long time and you get to meet some, some good people in this industry and, and you're certainly one of those and it's been yeah it's been a, a long long time dash tell us about your upbringing and why you got into sport and how you come about wanting to be a broadcaster how did the whole pictures look i always loved footy and, and my dad was i guess just about as passionate about it as i was i played footy growing up all through my uh my childhood and i think like most people you dream of playing afl that's your first priority when you're a kid when you realize that you're not quite gonna obviously get to, to that level you, you think about ways that you wanted to stay involved i was never someone who who loved loved school or loved maths but I was always very good with numbers I, I had a, a weird thing where I would remember numbers I'd remember home phone numbers I'd get patterns in numbers I'd remember basically any statistical fact that I ever read I would remember if it was cricket every century that a certain player scored every score in an Ashes series series score lines players averages and higher scores and total runs and things like that and in footy it was the same grand finals I could remember every game that uh, the team that I barracked for St Kilda play but also a lot of others as well if I watch a game I'll remember the score of that game forever basically it's just a weird thing like that so I used to do the stats at home occasionally watching the Friday night football and things like that back in the day with the pen and paper and yeah I thought I'd, if I can't play AFL I'd love to sort of cover it and um, yeah did a journalism degree with the aim of getting into sport didn't do any sports related studies just just journalism and yeah just sort of progress from there getting a getting some volunteer work with Casey Radio in Cranbourne uh, calling the VFL uh, which is actually Actually, where I think I met you as well when uh, yeah. back in those days, about the same time as SEN, and and yeah, it just sort of it sort of grew from there. The thing about the numbers was that really mm. evident early on because people who have listened to you on radio, like I think it's freakish. I think it's an unbelievable ability to be able to pull a number. Like I could say to you, how far back do you go? How far back do, uh, can you go? What year? Uh, for grand finals, I can go all the way back to well, most of them in in history, but but confidently from sort of 1970 onwards with grand finals. But I could do the majority of those before that. So uh, what sports are your, are your favourite statistical memory? Um, yeah, so certainly AFL cricket, hugely so. Like, I mean, I could tell you that, you know, Mark Taylor scored 7,525 runs at 43.75 with 19 centuries, those sorts of things. Tennis is a sport I'm passionate about. So slam winners, uh, Melbourne Cup winners, the Football World Cup, th those sorts of things. A lot of the, most of the major milestones. But I could probably tell you every game St Kilda's played since 1990 when I started following it and I could probably tell you every grand final school just about ever. That's fascinating. I hear you can go back to every St Kilda game from what year, Darren? So from basically the time I started following them which is when I was about five in 1990, I could probably tell you the score of every game they've played in that time. So. Why, why St Kilda, Darren? As in why did I barrack for them? Yeah. My dad was the most passionate in the family but it started with, so my grandfather and his family came across from the UK when my granddad was very young, three or four in the late 1920s and they settled in St Kilda it's where they lived and my granddad obviously they were British initially but my granddad's first job when he was 12 years old was selling the football record at the Junction Oval so that was at the old St Kilda home ground in the late 30s so yeah he he developed a bit of a following from them and back then because football was more suburban you often barracks for the town that you lived in it's a bit different now obviously but uh yeah so they grew up as St Kilda supporters I often joke with granddad that his family should have settled in Glen Ferry Road or somewhere around about that way and life might have been very different but um yeah so that's sort of how it started my dad and uncle were pretty passionate St Kilda supporters. I actually, when I was a very young child, I, I flirted with barracking for Geelong for a few months when I first started following football because I loved Gary Ablett Senior initially. And I think I remember I tried that for a few weeks and then Geelong played St Kilda in a game. Geelong won the game and I was disappointed, just naturally disappointed. So I think it convinced me that I did barrack with the Saints whether I wanted to or not. You obviously went to some games at Moorabbin. What was your most famous 
St Kilda game at Moorabbin and why? I only remember probably a handful from when I was at Moorabbin. One of the last ones was in 1992 uh, when St Kilda played North Melbourne. Tony Lockett kicked nine in that game. The Saints won by eight points. I remember that because there was a fight in the crowd. As a young kid, I remember seeing that. And when I was very, very, uh, probably the year before when I was five or six, I only have the, the vaguest memories of this. But St Kilda drew with Collingwood at Moorabbin when Collingwood were the reigning premiers, so early 91. And I remember Robert Hart Harvey missed a running shot at goal with about 30 seconds to go that would have won St Kilda the game. We were sitting sort of below the broadcast area and I didn't know who Rex Hunt was, but I remember Rex Hunt calling that, leaning out of the window, shaking his fist. So I actually had lent out of the window calling that passage of play. I had no idea who he was or what this person was doing. And uh, yeah, my dad filled me in. But yeah, I remember that. Was that the day that Steve McCann played on Tony Lockett and he wouldn't stand within 15 metres of Lockett? I was actually at that game when he kicked those goals. It was an unbelievable game of football. And the crowds at Moorabbin were very unique, very loud crowd, uh, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I got lost in the in the crowd at um, St Kilda's last game at Moorabbin was in round 20, sorry, it was in, in 1992 when they beat Fitzroy. And I remember there was a big sort of rush after the game of spectators because St Kilda did some presentation. And I remember getting lost in the crowd and separated Dad that day. But yeah, the crowd was very, very loud at, at Moorabbin. And, and it was great to experience that as an adult, actually, last year before COVID, St Kilda played Hawthorne in a practice match at Moorabbin in about February and uh, that was the first time as an adult I'd been able to go to Moorabbin with that and, and watch the Saints play and whilst it was only a practice match it was a good crowd and you were standing on the hill drinking beer out of cans and stuff like that it was uh, it was just that great atmosphere. Dash what was the best sporting event you've called and thought I can't believe this I'm actually calling this game? Yeah, I was lucky enough to call a preliminary final when Hawthorne played Adelaide in 2012 Hawthorne won by five points uh, that night yeah, I guess to get up to that level and, and have it be that special um, I called the game after the siren when Sam Lloyd kicked the goal for Richmond to beat Sydney in 2016 things like that are pretty memorable just when you get that chance to uh, to to call a, a big moment in a game and to call that passage of play so a lot of it's those moments but for me it's probably who I've had the chance to call with so when I was a kid I idolised Rex Hunter when I decided I wanted to be a caller it was in 1993 when Essendon played Adelaide in the preliminary final I was in the backyard just listening to the radio and Rex Hunt calling for AW as Essendon came from behind and won that. I remember thinking, whilst I'm nothing like Rex and, and wouldn't be able to call like him with that sort of exuberance and colour, um, I, I wanted to be a caller from that day. And with him, uh, Drew Morfitt was obviously a guy I watched and Sandy Roberts as well. And then in that 2015-16 period, to call with all three of those guys at various stages, that's probably the thing in a football sense that I remember most, just getting to call AFL games with those guys that I watched growing up that, that meant a lot. What's your best sport to call for you? What, what do you like the most? Is it football? that Because you have called tennis and cricket. What other sports have you called? Uh, soccer, basketball, and, and a bit of netball as well. But um, but my favourite sport to call is, it's still Aussie rules, but, but cricket is good. I, I was lucky enough to call the um, when the World Cup was out here in 2015. I called a game between, so it was actually between Australia and Scotland in Hobart, but also a game between Australia and Sri Lanka at the SCG, which I think was a auto final or the is either a quarter final or a semi final of that World Cup and that's really good fun cricket's a great sport to call because you can have that conversation in between and you know you got a lot of creativity with what you can do but, but probably football just because of how quick it is and how how much it bounces around and the best part about calling is that you never know a what will happen and you know that the two calls and two games will never be exactly the same as each other which is um which is one of the great things about it you've been involved in a pick a box or a trivia I'd hate to go in with you with trivia because <laughs> I go on, want to go on your side, not the opposition side. Have you ever done in any competitions or anything where they've tested your knowledge with numbers and memory and those sort of things? It's a funny one because um, my memory is poor for a lot of things, but but good for numbers. So I'm one of those people that will um, walk out to the car, sit in the car, realise I've forgotten something like my phone or my wallet, go back into the house and then forget why I've come back in, as in what did I forget again? What, did I, what have I come in for? But for numbers, so phone numbers, all of that sort of stuff I've, I've always remembered. When I was a kid, it, it's probably all tied together. I'm not great at maths, but I'm good at mental arithmetic. So if it was algebra or probability or any of that sort of stuff, I'd be no good. But if it was just a case of what's this plus that or this times that, then I could answer that quickly. And when I was in grade prep, they, they put me in a maths competition against the grade sixes, which was just what's 12 times 12, what's 15 times eight. And I was sharp in that. So that was one where I was able to sort of test against it. As for the memory, I don't know what they call it, whether it's identity 
memory or it's not photographic memory because I'm really bad with faces. And it annoys me sometimes because I'll, I might be, at, at, when I used to work at a petrol station, I'd have locals come in and say, oh, hello, Darren, how are you going? And I knew who they were by looking at them, but I just couldn't place it. So I'm not sure what the terminology is, but I'm, I'm good at remembering numbers, but I'm, but I'm really bad in other areas. So yeah, it's hard to, hard to explain. As I work at MCG, as my little background here, is it, um, I see a lot of people and they, they're, do, they're, they're doing notes and numbers. Do you actually do any homework, Darren, for, I mean, you've been on air many times doing mm-hmm. overnights and shows in SCN when you were doing that and on other stations as well. Did you ever do any homework and stuff to for the show, preparation? Um, a little bit. If I was doing a guest, I, I try to base my homework around things that aren't obvious to find. So um, it might be if I'm, you know, for tennis, for example, I was doing a lot of research recently for the French Open, sort of doing work around that where you can find, oh, this person person's won 23 titles this person's won seven grand slams this person's 34 they're ranked three in the world you can find that easily it's just more i I prefer to sort of research and drum down into that sort of stuff like okay so this tournament's on clay uh they've won you know 18 of their last 22 on clay or their record on clay is the worst of their four majors they haven't won a they haven't gone past the third round here so i sort of prefer to drum down specifically and, and look at that sort of stuff and with research i a lot of people like to write questions but my preference is to write dot points so so the questions sort of flow a little bit more and, you, and you're not yeah. stuck but yeah like I, I actually enjoy that part of it it's probably why I enjoy researching statistics and backgrounds and, and things like that and because I, I maybe I just sort of have faith that I'll retain it which is which is good so so if I, if I picked Rafa or Roger Federer Rafa Nadal or Roger Federer and mm-hmm. would you be able to tell me information about those two players just by without even looking at anything like- most of it like there'd be, there'd be some I'd have to look up so so um, Rafa's, you know, his record at the French is 105 and three. So he's only been beaten three times there. Although there was one year where he withdrew, which doesn't count as a loss because he wasn't actually beaten on court. Um, you could break it down and say that, you know, Rafa's won 20 Grand Slam titles. He's won 13 of them at the French. Uh, he's won four at the US Open, two at Wimbledon and one at the Australian. Whereas uh, Federer, uh, with his 20, has won, I think, six Australian Opens, five US, one French and eight Wimbledon. So things like that uh, could come in. But um, um, I'd be curious to drum into, you know, Nadal's overall clay court record. So like at the French Open, only I think eight players have ever taken a set off him and only five players have ever taken two sets off him. Things like that, which I find really interesting. If you, We know that Rafael Nadal, for example, is an unbelievable player on clay especially, but I'd like to go right in there and grab what's the most remarkable statistic I could find out of all of that. And then I'm like, okay, he's, he's won 105 of his last 112 sets, for example. Like statistics like that are extraordinary. So yeah, I, I, I always sort of like to, to dig into that sort of stuff. Is that men and women? So you obviously got a handle on the women's game and the men's game. So no matter what sport or what mm-hmm. player, you've actually got it stored in the back here. Most of the time, like on the women's side, it's interesting because obviously you're more likely to remember the, I guess, the iconic names. So like a Serena Williams, we know on the women's side, it's been a bit more even lately. So on the men's, you've had these three guys dominate. So it's easy to remember what they've done. Whereas on the women's side, for example, you might have Fiatek or Ostapenko or Krejcikova, these sorts of players pop up and win a slam that they haven't quite obviously established themselves as much. Whereas Serena, you could rattle off the 23 and the, everything else that she's done over the course of her career. So, yeah, it, it's probably more those players that have left significant legacies uh, at this point. What's Darren Parkin doing at the moment? Where does media see Darren Parkin moving forward? Yeah, so I've spent 12 years with with SEN and, and thoroughly enjoyed all of that experience. I'm um, doing a few different things now. I'm um, doing a bit of work with the ABC, which is a bit more into a broader journalism sense, uh, doing some stuff other than sport with them. Uh, I grew up in the country. So I'm doing a lot of the regional stuff with them, uh, which is which is good fun. I, I sort of like dealing with those sort of community issues. Tell me, with, tell me a bit the, more about that, Dash. What, what's that one? Yeah, what so um, the statewide drive program, which airs on a um, so it's Monday yeah. to Friday, all over regional Victoria, so through Ballarat, Warrnambool, Gippsland, Bendigo, everywhere. So I've been doing a bit of production with that. Um, I've been doing working for Channel Nine around the French Open and again with Wimbledon and with the Herald Sun and TLA through a guy John Clark who used to work with. 
with um, yeah. with SEN back in the day. Of I'm working with Kevin Sheehan calling the NAB League, which is the old TAC Cup for the under 18s, and that that's on the Herald Sun for Herald Sun subscribers. So yeah, my, my passion's been for for AFL calling for a long time. I haven't done as much of it lately as as I would like, and it's a passion that I'm trying to keep alive. I mean, the media landscape has changed a bit in the last few years with um, Croc Media is merging with SEN, so it sort of squeezed up a few of the opportunities, but also just with COVID last year and no one traveling, um, it meant that you didn't have callers tied up in different places. And this year it's been similar where a lot of organizations are obviously worried about traveling interstate and understandably so. My fear is that may reach a point where that doesn't happen really ever again because it's proven cost effective that it doesn't need to. So yeah, I, I'm just trying to pursue the calling opportunities, but also doing a few things a bit more um, a bit more community-based. Now, uh, for those people watching the show, Darren is a member of the Hill End Football Club. Now, can you tell the viewers where Hill End is, what the population of Hill End is, Darren? <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting one. So for those that, that know Gippsland, um, Hill End is up on the hill between Warrigal and Moey. So if you were driving to Terrelgan, Bansdale, Lakes Entrance, for example, if you went past Pakenham down the highway, uh, you'd pass Warrigal, and then you go down to a town called Trafalgar, which is where I grew up. You turn left and head 15 minutes up the hill, and you get to a place called Willow Grove. Now, the township of Hill End is actually a bit out of Willow Grove, maybe five or six k's out, but we're based in Willow Grove, despite being called Hill End. Uh, if anyone knows where Blue Rock Dam is, if you Google it, there's some infamy in the area, which is not our fault as, as locals. It's probably a bad story, but if people want to know the references around it, the Jaden Lesky murder trial, if you remember that from the uh, the mid to yeah. late 90s, he was, he was from Moey, and unfortunately, his body was actually found at Blue Rock Dam, which is where backs onto our football ground. So oh, okay. sadly, that might be how some people actually know of the area, but we are a beautiful part of the world. We're a lovely scenic town up on the hills that looks down onto the uh, the, the valley and, and down onto sort of central Gippsland. The population would be oh, three or 400. It wouldn't be many. I know Trafalgar's population is 3,000 at the bottom of the hill and Willow Grove's a lot smaller than that. So um, we hadn't won a premiership for um, 40 years. So 1981 was the last time we won the flag. We've had a, a pretty tough time of it of late. 2019, we're, we're actually able to play in the grand final. We came from nowhere and made the grand final. Got beat by a team called Yulon North. People would know Yulon from the Yulon Power Stations. Yeah, but yeah, Yulon North have, have left the, the league. There's been a bit of a change around where our league, Mid Gippsland, moved the Alberton League, which is based around South Gippsland with teams like Foster and that. So Yulon North left the league uh, as a result of that to play in the North Gippsland League. So our attitude was, well, the undefeated Premier is out. We lost the grand final. We're probably close to favourites. There was no footy at all in 2020. We're eight and zip in 2021. We're on top of the ladder undefeated. Uh, we obviously did play for three or four weeks because of the recent lockdown, but um, got out there on the weekend and had a win. So um, fingers crossed. Uh, I've um, I barracked for St Kilda and I've played for Hill End. I've, I've literally, for someone who loves footy as much as me, I've never seen a flag at any level. Never seen St Kilda win one, never seen Hill End win one, never played in one. Just hopeful touch wood that, that maybe it's our time. So just a bit brief about uh, how many years Hill End have been going yeah, so I think we were formed, the top of my head, in about 1926 or thereabouts. We have won six flags as a club, but our last was in 1981. We won back-to-back -back flags in the 70s and in the 40s as well. 1981 was the last time we won the flag, and, and that was also, I think we played in the grand final in about 86, but we didn't win that one. Yeah, and we hadn't made the finals in the seniors since 04, before um, 2019 when we made the granny. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've been around for nearly 100 years. Fingers crossed we can uh, get flag number seven. Colours? Green and gold. So uh, green with a gold V. I think Lee and Gatha and Garfield wear the same colours as us for those that, that know those football clubs. But yeah, green with a green with a gold V. But yeah, some, some great people down there and sort of try to get back as often as I can. And we have a past players function every year where it's good to get a lot of big names down and have a chat. Rex was, was one of those that sort of came down. But uh, I'm probably more familiar than most that a lot can go wrong when you get to, to finals. I've seen, uh, I've seen every conceivable way for things to to go pear shaped, but yeah, there's just every everything fingers and toes crossed that, that maybe it's our turn. Darren Parkin, thanks for joining on A1 TV, the Mark Show. It's been great having a great chat. 
I really respect you as a person and a, and a commentator, broadcaster. And I think that uh, there's a lot of people in the media that, you know, do a really great job. But Dash, you've got a lot of talent. For someone who can, if you've met Darren or you know of Darren or you listened to Darren before, that you can rattle off numbers and statistics and players and information from most sports. It's an amazing talent. Do yourself a favor. Google Darren Park and have a look at some of his work. You'll be quite amazed. Dash, thanks very much. Thanks, mate. Yeah, I, I love that. I remember it. But at the same time, I wish I had a skill that was a bit more useful in general day-to-day life. Unfortunately, how, I can't do much with it. But um, how is your how is your new wife going, Darren? Going very well. Yeah, she's she's very well. So she she has a job that's far more important than mine. She uh, she's a physio in a hospital, working and, and helping people recover from surgery and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, she's a uh, she does far more significant work than I. But I, I love it all the same. So. All right. Thanks, Dash. Thanks, mate. Cheers.